So in my line of work, sometimes you get rained on. And <laughs> while we did receive a fairly substantial douching this morning on the range, it's nowhere close to the downpour that we received over at the AK Files. So if you guys haven't been paying attention, I posted a thread over at the AK Files uh, detailing the progression through this test. I've also posted it on my website, but I thought it was a good place to publish a, uh, a write-up along with some pertinent photographs and of course the video links and things like that. And uh, what I will say is while they have been beating me up pretty bad over there, <laughs> they're at least in touch with modern means of communication over there. When I posted a similar thread on ARFCOM, uh, it was like they had an aneurysm when I posted a video link. It was quite amazing to see how disconnected they are from modern communications. But hey, whatever their site, they run it their way. It has been a good time running that thread over at the AK Files. It seems like every morning I woke up with something funny to laugh at, so good job over there, guys. It is currently April 19th, and I thought that because it's raining outside that we'd take the opportunity to get in our final debrief on the Visca rifle. And what I plan to do with this one is to do a mashup of some of the testing that I sent it away for, as well as do a comparison between when the rifle was new, the photographs that I took when it was new, and the photographs that I took after the 5,000 rounds. You've probably already seen some photos roll in at this point. So I sent this rifle off to Brian Keeney of Occam Defense, and if you guys are fans of the channel, then you have seen him previously, but he has access to some equipment that I simply just don't have access to. And on top of that, he's also a third party that can check my work. And if you guys aren't familiar with the way science is done in the real world, a scientist publishes their findings and then their peers review their work and oftentimes attempt to replicate their work. So that's just the way science is done. And that's the first thing that we're going to do uh, in this video is I had Brian try to headspace this gun with his SAMI gauges to see if it passes on his gauges as well. Hey folks, Brian Keeney here with Occam Defense measuring headspace on the Visca for Curtis. Um, we are going to use the um, SAMI gauges. They have this little swella in the, in the rear end here. Um, so to do that, I'm making sure that I've got a cleared gun. I'm going to throw that gauge in there. And I've got the, um, the extractor claw on the firing pin out of the bolt there. I'm going to come forward. I'm going to get it just past the, the, um, the hammer there. Okay, so we're going to take, I've just got a chunk of um, 375 tubing with a 49 thousandths wall thickness, it says. It's about 7 inches long. That gives me a really nice place to push from. I've got a um, uh, an analog force gauge, it's an NK500, and I'm just going to come forward in one smooth motion until I have 20 kilograms registering. Okay, so I'm just going to come forward in one smooth motion until I hit 20 kilograms. And it doesn't close. I've got, you know, about 10 millimeters or so of, um, of space between the front of the bolt carrier and the, um, and the trunnion. So cool. Passes on the SAMI spec as well. And through a little bit of research, I found that there's about 11 thousandths difference between the go gauge and the max headspace gauge, or also referred to as the field gauge. Um, and really the difference between the SAMI spec and the CIP spec is where the tolerance is loaded in that spectrum. So for instance, you might have a, an AK that you throw a go gauge in and it swallows the CIP go gauge with no problem whatsoever, but then you throw the SAMI gauge in and it might have a little bit trouble, it might be a little bit tight on the lockup. So there's just one anecdotal instance I've seen repeated multiple times throughout the internet. So uh, along those same lines, you will see that we used a uniform procedure for head spacing of the AK between my place and Brian's. And that's because we actually uh, came up with a procedure uh, for checking of headspace that has a definable metric for the poundage that's applied to the carrier during headspace. And this was a collaborative project with myself, Brian, uh, Robert Forbus, and John Holton. So uh, I did publish a video out on this and I have the procedure published on my website as well. So if you guys want to check that out, I'll have links in the description box down below where you can find that. 
Hey folks, Brian Keaton with Occam Defense here and I am measuring the hardness of a bolt on the Visca for Curtis today. And to do that we're going to use a Rockwell hardness tester. Um, ours is a little jacked up but it takes good readings. Um, so the, the way this works, if you look down here, is there's an industrial diamond and there's a lever that will press down with that diamond into the metal and the harder the metal is the smaller the divot it'll make and you can see I've made a couple other tests here there's a little a little one there and um, so the softer the metal the deeper that diamond gets squished in there and so here we go we're gonna just center this thing up in find a nice centered place there and now we're going to come tight and we're going to preload it. You're going to watch this dial go around. Um, and then I'm going to hit a trigger, and so we're going to pre-tension it with this movement here. So we're just forcing the, the metal up. Now we're going to put a weight on it, now that we've gotten it to that tension. So I'm just going to hit a trigger, but the cameraman's going to sit on this dial here. So it rotates, and then we wait for the... There's a, a mass system in the back here with a little damper on it. So we're just waiting for that thing to fall and put its full weight against the diamond. All right, and now we're going to come back. And we're, that's consistent with the other, within a point or two. So we're at Rockwell 1, 2, roughly Rockwell 43 or so, 42 and a half um, on the C scale here. And you use different points and different weights for the different, uh, for Rockwell B versus C. Um, but this is right in there for a, a good uh, hardness for this bolt. So we thank Brian for performing that test on the Visca for us on the bolt, getting us a reading on the hardness. And while we're on the topic, I do want to point out one thing, though, as it pertains to this rifle. As far as the prints that I have been privy to, the bolt is supposed to be one of the hardest parts of the AK. It's supposed to be harder than the trunnion. We did not perform a hardness test on the trunnion of this gun, but we know it's made of S7 tool steel, so we can surmise that it's relatively hard depending on how it's been heat treated. I would also say that the bolt didn't really deform through this test, as you guys saw, and the trunnion lugs did not really deform in this test through 5,000 rounds. So I have to ask, how balanced is that? And if they are right there with each other, is that correct and is that all right? I'm not sure. All I can say is that the gun made it for 5,000 rounds, so the formula that they used using an S7 trunnion uh, looks like it checks out, even though it's contrary to the prints that I've seen. Alrighty guys, the moment we've all been waiting for, time to push on that pin. If you guys haven't been following around on the internet, there were some early samples that went out that uh, some pins were coming out pretty easy. Uh, James down at uh, Tactical Response and his team did that test in concert with Tim Harmson over at the Military Arms Channel. They had some issues with the pins falling out. So we're gonna put a calibrated cell on that pin and see how much force it takes to push it out. Brian here with Occam Defense, uh, testing the amount of force it takes to move the barrel pin uh, on this Visca for Curtis here. Um, the way that Century has made this trunnion is different from most. There's normally um, a much different shape here. So this is normally sucked in a little bit. So we're going to have to use a little bit of abnormal tooling. You're going to see me doing something a little funky. What I'm going to do is carefully get this guy like that in there because my normal jigs are expecting a bump right right where that guy is. So it would normally be like that, but that's going to result in some tippiness. So we're going to patch this together here and hopefully get a good number. Sucker was in there. <laughs> Jeez. 
Yeah, I mean, we got a clean push. There's nothing, I didn't mar it or anything. That sucker was just really in there. Apologies for the compressor noise. We're just in a working shop here. That literally popped so loud it hurt my ears. Um, yeah, that was pretty impressive. Okay, so we're just gonna push this pin back in here and see how much force it takes. I do not enjoy that. <laughs> I know it's gonna be loud. Man, this is nuts. Not in a, it's, I'm not saying the product's not good. 8,000. I think it, whoa. 10,000. <laughs> All right, that's, at least it's consistent, I guess. Um, I don't know what that's about, but I don't, yeah, it's in there tight. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, so that's a lot of pounds to hold in an AK barrel pin. Uh, and where that statement comes from is actually Brian and I did a test earlier in the year, and uh, I'll have a link in the description box down below where you can go see that video, uh, where we did some sampling of various AKs across the industry to see what it takes to hold in a barrel pin. And that work was directly in response to uh, the initial problems with the Visca. So uh, because of that, uh, we came up with limits of 1,000 to 6,000 pounds. And to dig into that a little bit more, the 6,000 pound limit is not a safety limit, but what it is is a gauge of how well the AK was manufactured. When we talk about inserting barrel pins between the trunnion and the barrel, uh, what we're talking about most often, uh, the, the nomenclature is interference. And if there's a lot of interference, the, the poundage is higher. It, basically that poundage lets you know uh, how well the port was reamed before installation of the pin occurred. From the popping that you saw and also the poundage, we can surmise that the port for the pin on the Visca was not very well reamed. Real quick while I got you guys, and we're talking about tonnage on presses and stuff like that, I just thought I'd point out that if you go on the internet, you can find some absolutely ridiculous numbers out there. You see dudes that be like, well, my AK barrel pin was held in with 12 tons of force. Really, dude? 24,000 pounds? Do you have any idea how much that is? Can you even give me an estimate of how many cars that is? Uh, in, in science, you have to understand uh, the basic premise of when your instrumentation is lying to you. And to give you an idea how a lot of these dudes have gotten those numbers is they're in a garage somewhere and they got their 12 ton press and they put it on their AK barrel pin and it maxes out the press and they're like, well, 12 ton press, 12 tons of force. A 12 ton press, theoretically is supposed to be able to put out 12 tons. But due to inherent mechanical inefficiencies, we're looking at like maybe eight tons of force. So even hydraulics are not 100% perfect in the real world. So if you are an AK person and you are predisposed to hate sentry arms, and this video series did not thoroughly piss you off yet, I'm about to take it there. Enter the standard of plebeian rifle in the Wasser 10, and this one happens to be an underfolder. Uh, this is a new production Wasser 10, and the question that I see most often out there is why on earth somebody would consider the Visca when we have things like the plebe rifle out on the market today? And I would say that there are really two things that we need to consider that slant in the Visca's favor uh, over the Wasser 10. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a great gun, it's light, it's fun to shoot, but if you look at the parts manufacturer in this gun compared to the Visca, I'm just going to throw up a picture of the bolts side by side. The Wasser 10 has 500 rounds through it, and the Visca has 5,000 rounds through it, and the bolt lugs are way worse on the Wasser 10 than they are on the Visca, even with a tenth of the rounds through them. At new manufacturer, the lugs on the Wasser 10 looked like they were hammered out by an Eastern European peasant child, and they very well could have been, I don't know but there's just really no comparison between the two and the way that they look. So the other thing that I think is important to point out is, generally speaking, AKs manufactured in Europe do not take into account concentric bore threads. And um, generally speaking, that's not a problem when we're talking about running things like slant brakes and muzzle brakes and things like that. 
But if we're talking to say, trying to put a can on the end of the rifle, well then we start to run into issues rather rapidly. And what I mean by that is if the bore threads are not concentric, then you can destroy your can that is sometimes in upwards of a thousand dollars rather rapidly. Here in America, uh, threading is done at the time of manufacture when the barrel is still on the mandrel. So it's much easier to get a concentrically bored uh, American-made AK than it is to get one from Europe. And I'm not saying that you can't get a European manufactured AK that has concentric bore threads. I'm just saying that if you have one, you're one of the lucky ones because for every one that you find that is concentrically bored, you might find 10 or 20 that are not. So, for instance, the Visca has concentric bore threading, so if you're looking to run a can on your gun, then it might be something that is on your radar. All right, well, that's enough making fun of the uh, Wasser 10. This was a video on the Visca, and that constitutes the end of our testing on the Visca Poly 5000 round test. This rifle is now gonna get boxed up and sent back to Century Arms, uh, where they can do their in-house analysis, and the team at Vermont can yell at me for how I mistreated their rifle and stuff like that. Uh, but if it does come back, then I'm probably going to turn it into a project rifle. So if you are a uh, AK accessories manufacturer, go ahead and hit me up. Maybe we'll do some testing on your parts. And uh, guys, thanks for joining us for the Visca 5000 round test. You guys have been great. And hopefully we'll see you guys on a future video here at the VSO Gun Channel. Okay, whenever you're ready. All right, Brian here with us. <laughs> <laughs>